after spending 12 years at Harvard University, first working on an undergraduate degree, then a master's, and then becoming a proctor and a teaching assistant and teaching classes and doing a lot of research, Sean Aker decided to leave Harvard. He had finished his book that he'd been doing research for. He had three mentors that were pioneers in positive psychology, and he'd finished his book, The Happiness Advantage, and he went on a global tour. He went around the world lecturing, working with huge businesses, using his principles to help them increase the happiness in companies which also introduce uh, advance the productivity and the performance of the people. It was amazing the results that he got. On one of his trips, he went to Korea. Samsung, a huge electronics company, had invited him to come to meet with their key executives in their home office. So he went to Samsung as normal. He got there plenty of time. He got set up. His PowerPoint presentation was all ready to go. And as was his habit, being a pretty friendly guy, he wanted to visit with some of the people and kind of get a feel for them. He'd never been to Korea before. And as he tried to visit with the people there, he got blank stares. And nobody would really engage with him. They just looked at him. He'd never been in a situation like this. He wondered if he was violating some cultural norms, if he had been offensive to them. He just couldn't start a conversation, so he did what most of us would do. He went back to his computer and fiddled with his PowerPoint presentation, acting like he was doing something, waiting for the director of human resources to get there to introduce him to this large room full of executives and get the meeting going. He waited and waited, and it was right up to the moment when it was to begin, and somebody walked up and introduced himself and said, my name is Brian. I'm the director of human resources here. And he said, I'm very sorry to tell you, but our translator is not going to be here. And there's nobody here that speaks English except for me. And I'm going to be your translator. However, I'm really not very good with languages. Here he is about to do a seminar. Nobody bothered to tell him that it would have to be translated. And absolutely nobody there, none of their chief executives spoke English. So it was a rough start for the next three hours. He would speak for about one minute. And the translator would, translator would look at him with confusion or maybe burst into something that was extremely animated and go for about three minutes. And then he'd speak for less than a minute. This other guy would talk for about three minutes. And he was just wondering, what in the world is this person really saying to these people? How much of what am I saying does he understand? And after a couple of hours had gone by, he thought, this, this, I just don't know about this. It's got to change. So he decided to involve these executives. And he looked at the crowd and he said, what is your definition of happiness? And the translator looked at him and dropped his microphone and says, do you not know the definition of happiness? And he looked at the translator and said, I do, I'd like to know what their definition is. And then the translator said to him, I can, he covered his microphone, he leaned in, he said, I can Google it for you if you'd like for me to. He realized at this point, communication had broken down, but it brought him to a real good point. He realized these executives and this translator were afraid to even offer a definition for happiness. He had discovered from his research, happiness is hard to define. He worked with researchers and he discovered that they use terms interchangeably. They might say happiness, or they might say emotional positivity, or they might say positivity, and they use those terms interchangeably. As I told you the last couple of weeks, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. Sometimes there's confusion in the Christian church about the difference between joy and happiness, 
If you've been churches like I've been in most of my life, you've heard that joy is a fruit of the Spirit, and that is true. And they've also said that happiness is based on happenings, and it comes and goes. I just don't believe that's accurate. I've seen the work of scholars that use joy and happiness interchangeably. The Greek word makarios is used to mean happiness or blessedness. Today, we're going to look at a scripture in Psalms, Psalm chapter 1, and we're going to see what God has to say about happiness. As we look at Psalm 1, we're going to realize that God tells us, shows us it's something we have to choose. He shows us we have to develop a skill set, and he shows us what the ultimate results of happiness will be. I'm so happy to bring to you some significant research about happiness. This is based on over 200 different research projects that involve 275,000 different people. One of the things I celebrate about the Bible, as Hebrews said, it's living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the person of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's been debate for a long time, which came first, the chicken or the egg? In this situation, which comes first, success or happiness? Most of us grew up with something, and I loved when the psychologist said, don't trust everything you think, because sometimes the things we think we know just aren't so. Most of us were trained. We were conditioned all of our life. We had parents who had survived the wars, who had survived the Great Depression, we come from that lineage, and their belief was if you work hard and you become successful, then you'll be happiness. That's the formula most of us grew up with. The research very clearly says most of the time, happiness enhances, promotes, and enlarges success. Occasionally, there are going to be the naysayers that say, no, 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 you have to work hard to become successful. And a lot of those people that have worked hard to become successful are not happiness. The re are, they're just not happy. The research proves to us again and again and again, you have an advantage if you're happy. The more happy you are, the more an advantage you will have in your health, in your relationships, in your thinking, in your clarity, in your intellect, and in your performance and your productivity. Sir Richard Branson, who developed all of the Virgin Companies, said the most important thing in business is fun. And he's not saying that just because he's a nice person. He's saying that because he understands the concept. And if work is fun, workers who are having fun are just going to be more productive. It has been proven again and again in the research. We're looking at lots of data. And one of the things I celebrate so much about the Bible is if we wait long enough, and it may be hundreds or thousands of years, we find things in the Bible that science eventually figures out. I've always been impressed how Scripture is true, but sometimes we just can't understand it. And thousands of years after it was written, the latest modern sciences prove that it was right. 
So we're going to go to Psalm chapter one. We're going to see what God has to say about happiness. He's going to talk to us. He's going to show us it's something we must choose. We must develop a skill set. And he shows us what the ultimate results will be. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we're going to go back, and we're really going to focus on the first three verses. So in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, blessed, happy, joyful, emotionally positive is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked perish. Let's go back to that first verse, that first word, blessed. It's interesting when you think about the Psalms, the Psalms teach you how to get along with God. The Proverbs teach you how to get along with man. Psalms was written by several people, about six. We're not totally sure about everything there. We know that David wrote at least 73 of the Psalms. That's about half of them. Solomon, his son, wrote quite a, a few. Moses wrote some. Then there were some other worship leaders, some Levites, who also wrote different psalms that are recorded. It's a fabulous book of the Bible, and this is the opening line. Blessed is the man. Happy is the person. Joyful is the person. Emotionally positive is the person who does not do three things. Now think about this. The, the psalmist, David, a man after God's own heart, had a direct hotline to God, really knew the ways of God. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers. He hits three verbs there. Don't walk with them, don't stand with them, don't sit with them. It's so important what we expose ourselves to. The scripture, as Paul wrote, is very, very clear. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So let's look at the company you're keeping. It's very different today than it was back in those days. Back in those days, the only way you could connect with somebody was face to face. You had to be in their presence. They didn't have electronics back then. They would be together. But today, you've got your friends. You've got your friends that you get together with in person. But then you've got other people that influence you, people that you watch on television. The research has been conclusive. People who watch a lot of horror and violence and gruesome things are not as happy. Watching that kind of stuff lowers your levels of happiness. Confessionally, I got a little bit of work to do because I love action adventure movies and I love it when the bad guys get blown away. But the research says that actually lowers my level of happiness and they've done some hard studies on this. So what are you exposing yourself to? I've got several friends that are extremely politically involved and they watch the news all day and they want to be on top of it and they're angry all the time because things are not going the way they want them to go. They definitely believe it's better to know, even if it makes you unhappy, 
God values happiness and joy. If you want to know God's will for your life, probably the clearest statement in the entire Bible is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, which says, be joyful always. 24-7, God commands us to be joyful, to be happy, to be positively emotional and emotionally positive. Pray without ceasing. That means stay connected. Listen to God all day long. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You can't help but be happy if you're joyful and you're grateful and you're connected with God. So I would encourage you to get rid of the negativity in your life. Let go of those things that don't foster your happiness. Let go of those people, whether they're people you know personally or people you watch on television or on the internet, stay happy. Keep yourself in a positive frame of mind. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. He gives us clear instructions and God makes it clear in this first verse that we have to make a choice. Are you going to choose to be with people, to walk with them, to stand with them, to sit with them who bring you down? Are you going to make a choice to get away from them? And he keeps going about the choice. He says, but His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He thinks about what God says all the time. He considers it. He ponders it. He ruminates with it. He's constantly thinking about that. What's going on with you? How much of your time every day is thinking about the ways of God? When it talks about the law of the Lord, it's talking about the ways of God. How much time are you spending thinking about that? How much time are you spending talking about relationships that may be in a little bit of turmoil or that may have ended? How much time are you spending thinking about other things other than God? Happiness is ultimately going to come from God, and it's the only happiness that cannot be taken away from you. Only God can't be taken from you. Your life can be taken from you, but God cannot be taken from you. Your health can be taken. Your wealth can be taken. Your strength can be taken. Your mind can be taken, but God cannot be taken from you. And that is happiness. When you are fully connected with God, nothing else really will matter that much because you know how much God loves you, how much God is at wake, is at work, causing all things to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So here he's given us some skill sets. Sean Aker says in his book that happiness is not just a feeling, it is a work ethic. The research is out. When people are happy, they have an advantage over people who are not happy. Happy people perform better. Happy people have better relationships. Happy people have better health. So the skill sets start with delighting in the law of the Lord. Let me tell you what that does not say. I did it for about 40 or 50 years of my life. I looked at the law of the Lord. I knew what the rules were. I knew I better follow the rules because if I didn't follow the rules, God's going to be watching and he's going to hammer me. He's going to get me. He's going to punish me. That was not delighting. That was fear-based. It wasn't happy. It's like, I don't really want to live this way, but I have to because God's going to get me if I don't. David had learned, and I used to read the Psalms that he wrote and think, what kind of nutcase is this? I love your law. I love your statutes. I love your decrees. I just didn't get it yet. David did. He finally learned in his life that God's ways work. God's ways just work. 
Some of you are not happy. Some of you are depressed. Some of you are not peaceful. Some of you are anxious. Some of you are living in fear rather than living in love. Well, God says, hey, be loving, be joyful, be peaceful, be grateful. If you choose to do those things, they will make you happy. If you choose not to do those things, you're going to miss happiness. You're going to miss the joy of the Lord. He's trying to tell us it starts with believing and knowing and feeling and thinking that God's ways work better than mankind's ways. David got this secret. He's the writer of a bestseller, the Psalms of David. I mean, it's been number one on the charts since it was written. It's still around today, thousands of years later. It worked for him. So, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates every day. Let's go to the scripture and look at some of the principles we have that research is now bearing out. David said in Psalm 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Is God your rock and your redeemer? That's a big question. Is he your rock and your redeemer? This rock is something that's immovable. It doesn't move. It's solid. It's steady. Jesus talked about somebody who built his house on the sand and somebody who built his house on the rock. I live in a neighborhood where nearly every house in this neighborhood has had to have foundation repairs. It's, it's a dirt that's called Texas gumbo, and it just shifts a lot. When it gets wet, it, gets, it expands. When it dries out, it contracts. Houses, foundations break because it's constantly shifting. If these houses had been built with pylons that were deep enough that went all the way down to the rock, it wouldn't do that. If God is your rock, God will not move or shift or cause you to come undone. If he's your redeemer, no matter what happens, that means he redeems it for you. He, he changes it. He brings value from it. This is Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So the research is bearing out that meditation is good thing. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. That's what you're thinking about. What are you thinking about all day? The average person is thinking 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Are they thoughts about the law of the Lord? Are you delighting in God? Are you delighting that you are very close to God, that you're part of the family of God, that the Holy Spirit of God lives within you? He brings his gifts. He brings the fruit of his spirit. He brings wisdom. He brings power. It's all within you and it belongs to you. That's something to celebrate. That's something to meditate. When we watch the news, our focus is shifted from God to the trouble in politics, the trouble in the economy, the trouble with race relationships, the trouble in our country, the division politically, the trouble with the coronavirus. We need to keep looking at God and delighting in him because that indeed will make us happy with or without a coronavirus. We can be okay. Meditation has proven some interesting things. It always helps you calm down. It increases your empathy. It increases your awareness. It makes your immune system more effective and the benefits go on and on and on. The monks that spend their lives in monasteries meditating all day long, they've studied their brains. 
their left frontal prefrontal cortex, the center of happiness, has really grown and expanded just by meditating. You can use meditation without moving to the east and living in a monastery. You can use meditation for five minutes a day. Something I learned from my good friend, Rich Boyer, who was a cognitive therapist. We were good buddies at Lake Point Baptist Church. We were on staff together for years there. Before he came on staff at Lake Point, he worked at St. Paul. He worked in the office with a psychiatrist who often was difficult to get along with. And one day they kind of had it out in the office and he was upset and he was driving from St. Paul back home to Rockwall. We lived in the shores, the same neighborhood together. And he said he was just fuming when he left the office. He was unhappy, slammed the door in his car, which he realized was not a good thing to do. He was just upset. He got on the freeway. The traffic was slow. He had about an hour drive home. He wasn't happy about that. He just wasn't in a good place. And he thought, okay, I'm a cognitive therapist. I need to get on top of this. As he was driving home, he'd finally come to Lake Ray Hubbard. He was about to go over the bridges that crossed the lake twice on Interstate 30. And he just did an inventory. He did a, an inventory of his senses. And he asked himself, this is a form of meditation. What I see, well, I see the lake up ahead. I see ski boats. I see sailboats. I see jet skis. I have see water skiers. I see fishermen. I see a lot of people having a, a good time. I see the beauty of the lake. I see all the construction going up on the hills on the other side of it. He looks at this. He said, what I hear, he thought, well, I hear road noise. I hear my tires on the road as I'm speeding along about 60 miles an hour now. I hear wind noise, even though my windows are up. I hear the engine noise. I hear the radio. I hear the difference between the right speaker and the left speaker. He's driving those little Mazda RX-7, the one with the rotary engine. He just listened to all these sounds. He listened to the music. He listened to the voices, the guitars, the bass, the drums. He became aware of that and he thought, what I feel. He thought, well, my back's a little bit hot against these leather seats. My face is a little bit cool with the air conditioner blowing in it. I feel my body weight against this pretty comfortable seat. I feel my clothes on my body. He just became aware of the present moment, exactly what he was sensing. What I smell, well, I still can smell just a little bit of a hint of the newness of the car, of the leather seats, maybe just a little hint of the cologne I put on after lunch today. He smelled what I taste. He said, well, I don't taste anything. Yeah, there's always a taste in our mouth. Sometimes it tastes like us. Sometimes it tastes like what we just ate. Sometimes it's either alkaline or acidic, but there is a taste if you'll pay attention to it. And just by shifting his focus to his five senses and what he was experiencing in the moment, he got wrapped up on what a cool car he was driving home over a beautiful lake to a beautiful neighborhood on the lake with the golf course, with tennis courts, to a family that dearly loved him, and he just made himself happy. Meditation has been proven to help us. Another thing that's been proven to help us is exercise. And most of us know exercise is good for us, but it's amazing some of the results they're finding from exercise. There was one research project done with people that were relatively depressed. They brought this group of people in. They divided them into three groups. They tested their baseline. Now, all of us are born with a baseline for happiness. And most of us have been trained that it's genetic and it is who you are, and that's the way you are, and it will never change. That is not true. That was the belief before they discovered neuroplasticity, our, our brain's ability to change and grow and shift. We're not bound genetically like we thought we were. We can still learn new things. We can literally change our brains. We can make it become more productive. So they got a baseline for these people. And for four months, 
They had three different groups. One group only added exercise to their lifestyle. They exercised three times a week for 45 minutes. They did this for four months. Another group took antidepressants. That's all they did was they started taking pills once a day. They did that for four months. The third group did antidepressants and exercise. After four months went by, they measured their happiness. Everybody's level of happiness had gone up considerably above their baselines. But after that four months had gone by, they waited six months and they came back. They wanted to see if anybody had relapsed. Well, of the people who had taken the antidepressants, 38% of them had relapsed back down to the original baseline. They took the pills, the pills worked for a while, they got off the pills, no residual value. 38% of them relapsed. Then they tested the people that did pills and exercise, 31% of them relapsed back to their original baseline. But they were shocked. The people who exercised for four months, six months later, only 9% of them had relapsed to their original baseline just by merely adding that exercise to their life for four months. It makes a huge difference in our lives. Exercise does all kinds of good things for us. It gives us an advantage. Another thing that you might consider doing is having something to look forward to. I got a couple things this weekend I'm really, really looking forward to. I'm having dinner with a couple of friends on Sunday. That's always just an absolute blast. They're taking them out to dinner, and I'm really looking forward to it. Saturday, I get to spend some time with my girlfriend. I always have the best times of my life with her. I got something to look forward to. Having something to look forward to increases your endorphins by 27%. That's just a burst of happiness. Just looking forward to something. They tested some college students and they just had them think about watching their most favorite movie. They did blood tests before they started thinking about it. And after they thought about it for a few minutes, some of them, their endorphins had gone up 27%. Just thinking about something they really, really enjoy. So give yourself something to look forward to. And I know it's harder now than it's probably ever been in your life because of social distancing, because of quarantines, because of economic shutdown. There's so many things going on. It's harder, but still find something that you can look forward to. Another thing, another strategy that will make you happier is help other people people. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 13. Now you've heard nearly every week from me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. That's God's will for you. This is what comes just before it. The apostle Paul says in verse 13, about halfway through, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Pretty clear. Help somebody. When you get outside of yourself and you help somebody, it makes your life better. Related to that, there's something called signature strengths. About 20 years ago, the positive psychology movement started, and some of those people came up with signature strengths. They're all biblical. It's really pretty neat to see 
how even though they're written by secular researchers, they're biblical principles. I want to read this to you because here's the the research that was done. They took people, normal people, and for seven days in a row, every day they had them use some of their signature strengths five times during the day to be intentional about it, to know what their signature strengths were and to use those signature strengths five times during the day. They did this for seven days. So 35 times they used a signature strength. Their baseline happiness in that week went up considerably. I'm thinking that's that's to be expected. It makes sense. When we do something that we're gifted with, that's who we are, it makes us happier. Six months later, they were still up at higher levels. That was the only thing in their life that changed. For one week, they intentionally used their signature strengths, and they were still having happiness results six months later. Let me read you these happiness strengths, these signature strengths, because all of you have them. And when you do what you already have and you share it with other people, it's going to make you happy. It's a strategy. If you choose to be happy, this will help you become happier. Here they are. Tell me. See if you can't see the correlation with these secular strengths and what the Bible teaches, and then ask yourself if you don't have some of these signature strengths too. Bravery, appreciation of beauty and excellence, creativity, curiosity, enthusiasm, fairness, forgiveness, gratitude, humility, Humor, integrity, kindness, leadership, love, love of learning, open-mindedness, optimism, perseverance, perspective, prudence, purpose, self-control social intelligence, teamwork. Now, most of you guys are pretty good at most of that stuff. If you will use some of those signature strengths you have, that will increase your happiness. It's amazing how that works. These also tie into Romans 12, There are seven spiritual gifts listed there. I would call those seven in Romans 12 motivational gifts. I'm pretty sure all of you have at least one of those gifts, and it just just causes you to do what you do. It's like one of my motivational gifts is I'm a teacher. I just need to teach. I just do it. I have to be real careful when I'm with personal friends and we're having one-on-one conversations that I continue to be a friend rather than drop into teaching mode and start trying to teach. Prophets have a tendency to just, they just have to prophesy. Last night in Bible study, I had two people who were there who said near the end, and they're very prophetic people, I was tired. I just wasn't going to participate. I was just going to soak it up. I was just going to rest. I wasn't going to do anything. But by the time we got to the end, God had given them prophetic stuff for other people in the group. And they just like Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. It just had to come out. People with a gift of service need to serve. People with a gift of stewardship, of giving, need to give. Leaders need to lead. So when we do what God has equipped us to do, that increases our happiness. Now, let's go back to Psalm 1. We've looked at it is a choice. You have to choose who you're going to hang out with and what are you going to delight in. You get to pick and choose. And if you choose to be happy, you have to develop the skill sets which are going to come out of the laws of the Lord. 
exercise, meditation, helping others, using your gifts, things like that will make you a happier person. And then we get to verse three. three. This is the result of being happy. This is what comes when you are being happy. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. In all, in all, in all that he does, he prospers. Now, let's just assume that's true. Look at your life and look at what's prospering and what's not prospering. Let's go back up to the first word, blessed, happy, joyful, emotionally positive. You're going to be happy when you get the bad, the negativity out of your life and you fill it with delighting in the law of your Lord. As you continue to do things to make yourself happier, you're going to have an advantage. You're going to be healthier. You're going to be more productive. You're going to have better relationships. Everything starts to work together and you start to prosper in all that you do. I want to leave you with a number to remember. There was a man, Dr. Marcial, have to look at it. Loseda, Dr. Marcial Loseda. He got his PhD in psychology at Michigan and he did research on super effective teams. He came up with this number, 2.9013. 2.9013. That's real close to three. Now, the significance of this number is he researched teams that worked really, really well, and he discovered that's what's now called the Lasado line. And if, if you stay above that line, your teams will be successful. If you go below it, they don't succeed. They don't do well. 2.9013 to 1 is the ratio. That's what companies have to maintain for every one negative thing to succeed. They're going to have to have 2.9013 positive things, positive words, positive experiences, positive events for their teams to function successfully. That's the break even line. You got to have a 2.9013 to one ratio. He also did research and said when you've got six times as many positive things as negative things, that's when all of your team members start working together and max out their performance. So let's bring it down close to home. Let's look at children. Big challenge. Do your children hear six times as many good things, positive things, as they hear negative things. When you watch the news, are you getting a six good things to one bad thing ratio? This is, this is what we're shooting for in our relationships. We want to be six times as positive as we are negative. We want to be on teams and work for companies that operate that way. That's the difference between success and failure. So I encourage you, work on your positivity. I encourage you to choose to be happy, to develop the biblical skill sets that will make you happy, and to reap the benefits of everything you do prospering. That's what God has in mind for all of his children. Connect is all about you finding and enjoying a personal relationship with God. And you are invited weekly to learn more about how much God loves you and is eager to connect with you. Dr. Burris brings 34 years of formal education and two earned doctorates in spiritual direction and psychology to guide you on your personal experience with God. 
More lessons are at the links below, and you can also keep up with us by following us on YouTube, Vimeo, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Our hope is that you'll connect with Jesus and let Dr. Burris encourage you in your journey.